Hi, my name is Neil Druckmann, and I was the writer and creative director of The Last of Us, and this is Lessons from the Screenplay. Many people don't equate video games with storytelling. They might think they're simply about button mashing or blowing things up. But video games can tell deeply emotional stories with rich character arcs that you don't simply watch unfold, you participate in. The 2013 game The Last of Us from developer Naughty Dog is one of the very best examples of how to tell a story through the medium of a video game. In The Last of Us, you play primarily as a character named Joel, a smuggler who has to escort a teenage girl, Ellie, across a post-apocalyptic United States. And although the experience of playing a game is different than watching a film, the writers crafting the story face many of the same challenges. Writing dialogue on the page is one of the last things and one of the easiest things you do. A lot of the hard writing is structure. What are the beats that need to happen? How is each beat unique? How is it all working towards this ultimate message you're trying to say? Once you have that, then you kind of dive in deeper and say, okay, what are the tools we have? How do we make these interactive moments tell the story more so than the dialogue? As a longtime gamer, I've always been fascinated by the unique experiences created by video games, and I wanted to know how to create a compelling narrative in this different medium. So I sat down with writer and creative director Neil Druckmann, who was nice enough to answer all of my questions. So today we're going to look at the differences and similarities between storytelling in film and storytelling in games. To explore the techniques used to convey exposition, establish character arcs, and teach gameplay in an emotional way. And to examine the way a game can make the player truly experience a story. Let's take a look at The Last of Us. Uh, cool, so why don't we just start with what are some of the differences in telling a story in a movie versus telling a story in a video game? In the movie, it's so much about shots and how do you tell the story visually on the screen. Games are interesting is that you, you could have that, right? You have cinematics which operate like film, and so you need to be very familiar with the cinematic language. Then there is another layer of it, which is, of course, the thing that makes games unique is the interactive space. The fundamental difference between how the audience experiences a story in a video game versus a film is that a film goer is passive, whereas the player has agency. In film, you watch characters and empathize by observing their situation, their desires, their obstacles, their choices. This is true for video games as well, but there's also a more direct connection. You develop empathy through control. When you're playing a character, you connect with them in this very subconscious level, I don't even know how to articulate it, but you hear people say, I am Joel, or that part when they're finally playing as Ellie, this is totally unique to gaming, and we watch this over and over again as focus testers, get to that part and like, oh my God, I'm Ellie. And you see they change how they play because now they're seeing themselves as this child, this like teenager that doesn't have the stature of this large man, and they play differently, and they look at the world differently, and it's how you can use control of a character to create such strong empathy. This connection can be used to give the player the most compelling perspective for different moments of the story. One of the clearest examples of this is in the very beginning of the game. We had a very different opening. Um, we had an opening where you played as Joel and you went to the neighbor's house. You have to put one of these infected down and then run back and go get your daughter. And then you're playing as Joel every step of the way. And there was something about that opening that just felt very familiar. And then in brainstorming with some of the designers and other people, we had this aha moment of like, well, what if you didn't play as Joel? Dad? What if you saw the whole opening through his daughter's eyes? You in here? seem to be somehow connected to the nationwide Where the heck are you? People are just more scared playing a kid than they are a, a capable adult. And as you're going around the house looking for your dad and you're seeing this thing on the news. There seems to be some commotion coming from the- Get the hell out of here, it just get creepier and creepier. There you are. Sarah, you've got to get out of here. Do you understand me? Yeah. As Joel, his daughter, and his brother try to escape the erupting chaos, the player experiences everything from the point of view of Sarah. Until... Look out! Sarah's leg is hurt in the crash, so now you play as Joel. 
suddenly responsible for trying to carry your injured daughter to safety amidst the outbreak of an apocalypse. Don't look sick. Yeah. Why are they doing that? Keep looking at me, baby. During this sequence, you can't fight or hide. All you can do is keep running and hope you don't die. The player feels the stress and fear because they are the characters in this situation. Daddy, we can't leave him. He's gonna be fine. But the sequence does more than simply provide engaging gameplay. It establishes critical character backstory. Our characters have their own wants, needs, obsessions, loves, and we're saying, when you're playing our game, we want you to tap into who they are and play the game as them, not as you, as them. The Last of Us, like most films, is a story about a protagonist on a journey of change. It's my dog, I think her leg is broken. Stop right there! And like many protagonists, Joel has a ghost, a traumatic event that makes him afraid of change. <laughs> In this opening, we are living through Joel's ghost. Oh no. Sarah. Sarah. Danny. <sighs> After the title sequence, the game picks up 20 years later. After briefly meeting Joel's smuggling companion, Tess, the player takes control of Joel as they make their way to recover some stolen weapons. Here, the game uses environmental storytelling to provide exposition. What the player sees and hears while moving through a space provides critical details about the world and how it operates. There's a good summary of this section in the script for The Last of Us, which allows me to quickly answer one of the questions I had going into this video. What does the script for a video game look like? The answer is, it depends. Depending on the purpose of the script and the personal preference of the studio developing the game, the script format can range from proprietary story software to massive Excel spreadsheets. For The Last of Us, once the game was completed, all the various story documents were conflated into a single script. In this final script, the cinematics and key story moments are written in traditional screenplay format while the gameplay is summarized in prose. Here's the prose for this section of the game. The city is under constant martial law with soldiers posted at street corners. In another section of the city, suspects are lined up on their knees with their hands on their head. A medical soldier with a handheld scanner goes down the line, scanning people for the fungal infection. A woman tests positive and argues that she's not infected. Soldiers hold the woman down while the medical soldier injects her with a syringe. The woman convulses before dying. Another man on his knees stands up and runs away. Without hesitation, a soldier raises his rifle and shoots the man. It's clear that this world is a dangerous place. So how is the player supposed to navigate all of this? The Last of Us uses the narrative to teach gameplay mechanics in an emotional way. So usually when we start production on a game, the beginning is one of the last things you work on because that's when you have locked down your mechanics. Okay, now we need to train them. We have to like expose the player to each thing their character can do. But you don't want to just throw a, a big text box on the screen like that's your last resort. It's like, are there ways through the narrative that you could teach them? In the game, as Joel and Tess are on their way to recover their stolen weapons, there's an explosion in the quarantine zone. So they have to run and heal their injuries. Patch yourself up, all right? Following Joel and Tess along their usual smuggling path gives a sense of their routine and provides an opportunity to learn how to reload weapons. All right, Texas, boost me up. And one of my favorite ones that we did was, you know, all kind of shooters have, you press L2 to aim, R2 to shoot. And like, okay, how do you, what's an interesting way to teach that? And in the opening of the game, it's like Joel and Tess are trying to get to this guy, Robert. They're using their smuggling routes. One of them has infected in it. Hold up, spores. And as they crawl through, they see a guy on the ground, uh, another smuggler. Some of the environment has collapsed on him and he begs you to kill him because his mask broke and he breathed in some spores. My mask broke. Don't, don't leave me to turn. 
And then this box comes in. It's like, press L2 to aim, press R2 to shoot. And they're like, oh, that's how you're going to teach me to shoot. What do you want to do? So again, it's a way to expose you to a mechanic, teach you it, and put some emotional weight behind it and show you this is the world that you live in. Poor bastard. After some unexpected complications, Joel and Tess learned that the only way to get their weapons back is to smuggle some very unusual cargo. Joel, give me a hand with this. Ellie, a fierce 14-year-old girl, charges out from a nearby room, switchblade in hand. Get the fuck away from hey. me! Tess catches Ellie's arm. Ellie struggles to get free. Let her go. The relationship between Joel and Ellie is established quickly in their very first cinematic. I want Joel to watch over her. Whoa, whoa, I don't well, think shit, that's the I'm best not Ellie. Him? Cinematics are the part of video games that are most similar to film, and I was curious when and why they choose to use them. When do you use cutscenes? When do you not? Is there any kind of like logic or decision making? that goes into that. Yeah, so um, usually cinematics is for specific emotional turns where we want to slow things down or we want to look at someone's face, um, get a nuance of like a close-up performance that you can't do in gameplay. So for example, you know, Joel coming home and talking to Sarah and her giving him a watch, there's not gonna be a lot of interesting gameplay in that, but we still need to establish a relationship with these characters. We'll use a cutscene there. You like it? Setting up the contentious relationship between Joel and Ellie is an important plot point. In fact, it's the inciting incident of the game. And being able to see the performance of the characters' faces allows for nuance and subtext. What are you doing? Killing time. Well, what am I supposed to do? I am sure you will figure that out. Your watch is broken. As soon as the characters get outside the quarantine zone, it's revealed that Ellie is immune to the disease, that within her might be the cure. It's now up to Joel to protect Ellie and get her to safety. And we know from having played the opening sequence where he was unable to save his own daughter, why this is such an emotional task. So much of the game is the relationship between Ellie and Joel. If we don't succeed and make you care about this relationship, make you feel these characters love each other the way a father and a daughter can love each other, this unconditional love, we will have failed. Everything is depending on that. So is that everything you hope for? Jury's still out. But man, can't deny that view. But if a game is simply used cinematics to display the relationship between two characters, it would just be a movie. So the question is, how do you make the player feel a relationship? When you're playing the game, again, with the statement of like, we need you to care about this relationship, we need these characters to rely on one another, and so much of our game is action and combat, and if Ellie's just hiding and not participating, then you don't care as much about her. She starts feeling more like a burden. In The Last of Us, the player is constantly trying to overcome obstacles, everything from solving puzzles to fighting off infected. As you play, you're accompanied by Ellie, an NPC, or non-player character, who literally helps you overcome these obstacles. You have two characters, and you constantly have to think about, how do, how do I have to rely on one another? So, I might have a gate that I can't get past. Oh, shit. Jam from the other side. If I'm with Ellie, I can boost her over the gate, she can open it from the other side, so I'm learning to rely on Ellie. If I came on this gate and I didn't have Ellie, I'd have to find a different solution. Okay. Ta-da! Since the player is constantly in life or death situations, Ellie literally helps you survive. Ellie can save you. Ellie can pick up a brick and throw it at a dude and give you just enough opening for, then for you to put him down and survive. Likewise, if someone grabs you and pins you against the wall, Ellie might, if she's around, jump on the guy's back and stab him to give you that opening. So again, it's this feeling very unique to, to games of like, oh, I've learned to rely on this person. Now when they're not around, I want them around. But Ellie isn't there simply to enhance game mechanics. There is performance happening even when you're just walking around the city. The way she's talking and the way she's experiencing the scene and her demeanor is going to change how you feel about her. So for example, after Ellie and Joel get in a fight in the hotel in Pittsburgh. And you just hang back like I told you to. 
You could see her, she's crossing her arms more, she's more standoffish, she's talking less than she's used to. Where, again, in a film, you can control the pacing and the exact shots. Here, it's just like, oh, this person that's walking with me is behaving differently. This is what it feels like to be in a fight. The behavior of the NPC changes how you feel about them. So now that we've covered all the various ways the game makes the player experience Joel and Ellie's relationship, I want to look at one last sequence. It's one of my favorites in the game, and I think it demonstrates how all these pieces come together. Toward the end of the game, Ellie has a traumatic experience where she's taken by a group of cannibals and narrowly finds a way to escape. She grabs his machete and she kills David in the most brutal way, just hacks him. And even past the point where he's dead, and you're seeing this effect now, this, this her being on her own, fighting all these people, killing, murdering, it's having a toll on her. And we leave them just as Joel comes in and pulls her off of David and holds her and embraces her like his own daughter. He even calls her baby girl, the same phrase he used for his daughter. Oh, baby girl. It's okay. It's okay. Joel. It's okay. The game cuts to a few months later, but the weight of Ellie's experience remains. Where Ellie the whole game has been the optimistic one, the peppy one, she does jokes, she's the one that calls Joel and his bullshit, she just got all this energy, and you're coming in and she's quiet, and she's distant. You know, once we're done with this whole thing, I'm gonna teach you how to play guitar. Yeah, I reckon you'd really like that. What do you say, huh? She doesn't respond, and. You get this interactive prop above her head that you've had the whole game where you could talk to her, like, and you hit it again, like Ellie. And you hit it again, Ellie. Ellie, I'm talking to you. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure, that sounds great. But you could tell something is really off with her. Uh, and that was important for us to show that Ellie has an arc, that Ellie starts as this very innocent, naive person, and you can't survive in this world without it corrupting you in some way, without it having some toll on your personality. Here, the behavior of the NPC you're paired with is once again revealing character. Moments later, you're in a bus station and need to boost Ellie up to grab a ladder, something you've done time and time again in the game. Well, we could use that ladder. You've done it so much that now the game can subvert your expectations. So you, there's a ladder on top of a ledge and you call Ellie and you click it and Ellie's not there. Here we go. Ellie. And you turn around and you see she's just there sitting despondent. Ellie. What? The ladder. Come on. Right. It's hard to convey how surprising this is without actually playing the game, but it's one of my favorite moments in any game I've ever played. A perfect example of how to use gameplay mechanics to convey emotion. You feel what a toll this journey has had on Ellie. And then you boost her, and she starts lowering this ladder, and something catches her off guard. And she's like, oh my god, and she just drops the ladder and runs off. Oh my god. Oh. And now your panic starts to set in. What did you see? You call, yell out to her, she doesn't respond, so you have to like pick up the ladder, Ellie. climb up, and then go find it. Ellie! Here, empathy through control kicks in. The girl you have to protect may be in danger, and it's up to you to see if she's okay. And that's when this happens. You see that? Shh. Don't scare it. I won't, I won't. The giraffe moment is very much a result of really tight structure. We just came from a sequence where we want to show the toll of all the violence, the trauma it has on Ellie. You just feel so bad for her. This, this kid is gone. Maybe she'll never recover. And Ellie is just over the moon seeing these giraffes. And you can go up to them and you can pet them. Hey there. <laughs> so fucking cool. And the reason that that is there is to bring the, the child back. Is to show she still has that innocence. She still has that hopefulness. She can still smile despite all the horrible things these characters have experienced. She still has life within her. We get the briefest of cinematics where we see their faces during this emotional turning point. Is this everything you were hoping for? It's got its ups and downs, but you can't deny the view though. And we are one step closer to the completion 
of Joel's arc. The kind of life that Joel has like suppressed and shut down comes through with Ellie. And then it's like, that's probably the, the happiest moment, like coming from such the, the dark of winter to this really happy moment, that really sets us up for the darkness of what we need to head into. To me, like great story structure is constantly doing this. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that, that was what we were after uh, for the sequence. This quiet, happy moment sets the player up for the game's darkest sequence yet. What is your goal when creating a story, when creating a game? What experience do you want people to walk away with? What we wanted was to have the player be entertained. I think if it's not entertaining and it's boring, you're not going to stick with it. Love these characters the way we love them, understand them, and just making you reflect on these choices and question, like, what would I have done? And I think you only feel the weight of that question if you experience a whole journey with these characters. Joel and Ellie's journey is not just fun to play. It's a powerful story experience that cleverly uses the tools of its medium to deeply affect the player, making sure we won't forget our experience playing The Last of Us. If you're interested in doing your own storytelling in games, it would obviously be good to know as much as you can about both how to tell stories and how to make games. And one of the greatest resources for learning new skills is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators, with thousands of classes in game design, writing, filmmaking, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access, so you can join the classes and communities that are just right for you and your goals. If you're looking for a fun way to get a glimpse into working with 3D modeling and animation software, I recommend checking out Gustavo Torres' class, Motion Graphics and Cinema 4D, Design an 80s-inspired animated GIF. In the class, he uses Cinema 4D, Photoshop, and After Effects to make a cool 80s-style animated GIF. You can start the class today for free by heading to the link in the description below. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month, and by signing up with that link, you get two months for free. So head to Skillshare and start learning today. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the video. I want to say thank you to Neil Druckmann and everyone at Naughty Dog and Sony who helped to make this interview possible. We actually talked for about 40 minutes, so there were parts of the interview that had to be cut. But I'll be releasing these extra clips to our patrons. So if you want to help support the channel and get access to exclusive clips from my interview with Neil, head to the Patreon for lessons from the screenplay. Thank you as always to the patrons on Patreon and supporters here on YouTube for making this channel possible. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.